Amanda requested that I do a video on Daniel 11 and 12, so that's what I'm going to do in this video. Now, in order to understand who we're talking about here, we need to understand who the kings are that have already been discussed or the kingdoms that have already been discussed. In Daniel 2, we saw that Nebuchadnezzar had a dream and he saw an enormous statue and the head of the statue was made of pure gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of baked clay. And so Daniel in, in, and those feet had 10 toes and those 10 toes are going to be important as well. And they're going to be distinguished from the 10, the 10 kings that come out of the fourth kingdom in Daniel 7. So we have to make that distinction. We have to make sure that we're understanding that here there's 10 toes coming out of the fifth kingdom, but in Daniel 7, there are 10 coming out of the fourth kingdom kingdom. And a lot of people get this confused. They just see the 10 and they say, they think that it represents the same 10, but one's coming out of the fourth kingdom and one's coming out of the fifth. Now in Daniel two, we know that this, that the kingdom begins with Babylon because Daniel says to Nebuchadnezzar, that head of gold is you. So all we need to do is follow down who did Babylon fall to? And then who did they fall to? And then who did they fall to? And we know the first four kingdoms from scripture because scripture tells us very clearly, Babylon fell to Medo-Persia, Medo-Persia fell to Greece, Greece fell to pagan Rome. There are the first four kingdoms, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and pagan Rome. But there's a fifth kingdom here. And the fifth kingdom is whoever pagan Rome fell to. Pagan Rome fell to papal Rome. That's the reason why you see that the fourth kingdom is made of iron, but the fifth kingdom is made partly of iron, so has the strength of iron still in it, and which is Rome, and but it's also made, made of baked clay. Two things that do not adhere to each other, so-called Christianity and pagan Rome. So here we have papal Rome. You can't, those don't adhere to each other. We know that part of the fourth kingdom is in that fifth kingdom because it's made of the same material. We know that that fifth kingdom has 10 toes and that there is a rock not made by human hands or not cut out by human hands. And that rock is thrown to that fifth kingdom and all of the kingdoms come crashing down. That fifth kingdom of papal Rome just so happens that that's the Antichrist as described in Revelation, Babylon the Great, the harlot riding the beast, papal Rome. Everyone will have handed over their power and authority to papal Rome. And when papal Rome is taken down, everyone is taken down. Now I'm going to discuss the 10 toes, but first I need to discuss the 10 horns that are described in Daniel 7. So let's skip over to Daniel 7. The book of Daniel is not going to start with you know, a first set of kings and then switch over to a different set of kings. It's going to continue with the same set of kings. So you're going to see here that they discuss again four uh, kings or kingdoms. And then there is a, a horn that comes up and that is the fifth kingdom, very clearly describing the Antichrist. So again, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, pagan Rome, the, the horn that comes up, subdues three kings, has eyes like that of a human being and a mouth that speaks boastfully. Its body is destroyed and it's thrown into the blazing fire. That is, what's the fifth beast? Papal Rome. Again, the Antichrist. Now in, in Daniel verse seven, it says, after that in my vision, I looked and there before me was a fourth beast. So we're talking about papal, excuse me, pagan Rome, terrifying and frightening and very powerful. It had large iron teeth. It crushed and devoured its victims and trampled underfoot whatever was left. This is the kingdom that was reigning while Christ was here. So listen to the description of this, of this fourth beast. It was terrifying and frightening and very powerful. It had large iron teeth. It crushed and devoured its victims and trampled underfoot whatever was left. It was different from all the former beasts and it had 10 horns. Now in Daniel 2, you saw that there were 10 toes. The 10 toes are not the same as the 10 horns. How do we know that? Because the 10 horns are coming from the fourth beast in Daniel 7. The 10 toes are coming from the fifth beast in Daniel 2. You're going to have to understand this in order to understand Daniel 11. 
the ten toes that, excuse me, the ten horns that came from the fourth beast here in Daniel 7 are the ten Germanic tribes that became Western Europe. Ten Germanic tribes that became Western Europe. They terrorized Rome. You remember studying about like the Visigoths or the Goths? Well, these are the players of the end times. Papal Rome, the... 10 Germanic tribes that became Western Europe. You see what's happening in Europe right now. You see how the United States as the false prophet, if you don't know that, that, that the United States is the false prophet, you need to go listen to you know, some of the other videos that I've done, such as Revelation 17 and Daniel 7. That will help you to understand clearly, without a doubt, by process of elimination, exactly who the Antichrist is and who the false prophet is. So you see the United States very involved with Europe right now for no other good reason, but this is coming together. This is being united and all will give power to the Antichrist. So all will be reconciled and give power over to papal Rome. But you see in Revelation that they all hate her. They hate the Antichrist. They hate the harlot riding the beast. And it's they're not giving power because they love this harlot they hate her they're going to strip her naked burn her flesh satan's kingdom is divided he does not have a united kingdom christ has a united kingdom anybody saying that christ's kingdom is not united oh there's infighting in the church they don't know what they're talking about they're likely in a prostitute or the harlot they do not know what they're talking about because god's spirit in his true church those who worship him in the truth and in the spirit they are not divided they're united by his spirit. There's no way for them to be divided. Only Satan's kingdom is divided. All right. Now in Revelation, you see that Babylon the Great is the mother of prostitutes. She has daughters and they are prostitutes and they also hate each other. They are divided. They hate each other. These prostitutes are those that bore out of the Reformation. Now, who is Babylon the Great? Babylon the Great is papal Rome, began counterfeit Christianity, and she has daughters that bore out of her. Which kingdom is that? That's kingdom number five. So we go back to Daniel 2, which tells us that that fifth kingdom has 10 toes, 10 toes that came out of the fifth kingdom. There are 10 denominations that bore out of, there may be more now, but 10 that originally bore out of the Protestant Reformation. People often include Quakers with this. That's not accurate because Quakers did not reform. They were not trying to reform Catholicism. Their focus was not on the harlot. Their focus was on return to the purity of God's word. They were not a denomination. They are not a a daughter of the prostitute. They don't continue in things like tithing. They objected to the existence of an official priesthood and believed in the universal priesthood of all believers, which is correct. They did not observe holidays of the world. They held fast to the holy days of God. They maintained the purity of God's word, and they were the smallest group. Not surprising, they were the smallest group. Who are the 10 denominations that bore out? Adventists, Anabaptists. Anglicans and Episcopalians, Baptists, Calvinists, Reformed, Lutherans, Methodists, Moravians, Plymouth Brethren, and Presbyterians. These are the original prostitutes that bore out of the harlot. Whether there are more now is inconsequential. They are the original. That's what's being referred to here by the ten toes. The ten toes bore out of the fifth kingdom of papal Rome, the harlot riding the beast, Babylon the great, who has daughters who are prostitutes. Now that we understand that the 10 are two different tens, there are 10 toes and there are also 10 horns. The 10 horns bore out of the fourth kingdom, the 10 toes bore out of the fifth. Now we can read Daniel 11. And in the first year of Darius the Mede, I took my stand to support and protect him. Now then, I tell you the truth, three more kings will arise in Persia and then a fourth, a fourth who will be far richer than all the others. When he has gained power by wealth, he will stir up everyone against the kingdom of Greece. 
Then a mighty king will arise who will rule with great power and do as he pleases. After he is arisen, his empire will be broken up and parceled out toward the four winds of heaven. It will not go to his descendants, nor will it have power, the power he exercised, because his empire will be uprooted and given to others. We're talking about the same kings, guys. Same kings that have been spoken of in Daniel 2, Daniel 7, and now in Daniel 11. The king of the south will become strong, but one of his commanders will become even stronger than he and will rule his own kingdom with great power. After some years, they will become allies. Okay, now I explained this in another video. Do you recall that after Solomon uh, passed, after he passed, God had said that because of what Solomon did, because he married foreign women and he served their foreign gods and he caused Israel to do the same, that Solomon's kingdom was going to be broken up and his son, Rehoboam, was going to be rejected. He, for the sake of David, he didn't do this during Sol Solomon's lifetime. He did it to his son. And the kingdom was parceled out. It was separated. It was divided. And Israel became the, king the northern kingdom and Judah became the southern kingdom. There's a sort of mimicry that's going on here in this king of the north and king of the south. The king of the south will become strong, but one of his commanders will become even stronger than he and will rule his own kingdom with great power. After some years, they will become allies. The daughter of the king of the south will go to the king of the north to make an alliance, but she will not retain her power, and he, his power, will not last. In those days, she will be betrayed, together with her royal escort and her father and the one who supported her. One from her family line will, take, will arise to take her place. Okay, hang with me. I'm going to explain the different pieces, but listen to the buzzwords that you're hearing here. You have a prostitute, a harlot, that has prostitute daughters. So when they're talking about family line, this should help you to understand that something's going on. They have some kind of relationship. One from her family line will arise to take her place. He will attack the forces of the king of the north and enter his fortress. He will fight against them and be victorious. He will also seize their gods, their metal images, and their valuable articles of silver and gold and carry them off to Egypt. For some years, he will leave the king of the north alone. Then the king of the north will invade the realm of the king of the south, but will retreat to his own country. His sons will prepare for war and assemble a great army, which will sweep on like an irresistible flood and carry the battle as far as his fortress. Then the king of the south will march out in a rage and fight against the king of the north, who will raise a large army, but it will be defeated. When the army is carried off, the king of the south will be filled with pride and will slaughter many thousands, yet he will not remain triumphant. For the king of the north will muster another army larger than the first, and after several years he will advance with a huge army fully equipped. In those times, many will rise against the king of the south. Those who are not, vi excuse me, those who are violent among your own people will rebel in fulfillment of the vision, but without success. Then the king of the north will come up and build siege ramps and will capture a fortified city. The forces of the south will be powerless to resist. Even their best troops will not have the strength to stand. The invader will do as he pleases. No one will be able to stand against him. He will establish himself in the beautiful land and will have power to destroy it. Who's the beautiful land? We are. He will determine. So now we're starting to hear the Antichrist. He will determine to come with the might of his entire kingdom and will make an alliance with the king of the south. And he will give him a daughter in marriage in order to overthrow the kingdom, but his plans will not succeed or help him. Then he will turn, to, turn his attention to the coastlands and will ma take many of them. But a commander will put an end to his insolence and will turn his insolence back on him. So to the coastlands and will take many of them. But a commander will put an end to his insolence and will turn his insolence back on him. After this, he will turn back again toward the fortresses of his own country, but will stumble and fall to be seen no more. His successor will send out a tax collector to maintain the royal splendor. In a few years, however, he will be destroyed, not in anger or in battle. He will be succeeded by a contemptible person who has not yet been given the honor of royalty. He will invade the kingdom when his peop its people feel secure, and he will seize it through intrigue. Then an overwhelming army will be swept away before him. Both it and a prince of the covenant will be destroyed. After coming to an agreement with him... He will act deceitfully, and with only a few people, he will rise to power. Okay, we're hearing the Antichrist. We heard the persecution of God's people. Now we're hearing that Christ has died. 
The prince of the covenant has been destroyed. After coming to an agreement with him, he will act deceitfully and will, with only a few people, he will rise to power. So you want to understand the timing of what's going on right now. When the richest provinces feel secure, he will invade them and will achieve what neither his fathers nor his forefathers did. So now we're hearing the rise of papal Rome. He will distrib- distribute plunder, loot, and wealth among his followers. He will plot the overthrow of fortresses, but only for a time. With a large army, he will stir up his strength and courage against the king of the south. The king of the south will wage war with a large and powerful army, but he will not be able to stand because of the plots devised against him. Those who eat from the king's provisions will try to destroy him. His army will be swept away and many will fall in battle. The two kings with their hearts bent on evil will sit at the same table and lie to each other, but to no avail because an end will still come at the appointed time. The king of the north will return to his own country with great wealth, but his heart will be set against the holy covenant. Are we hearing antichrist? He will take action against it and then return to his own country. At the appointed time, he will invade the south again, but this time the outcome will be different from what it was before. Ships of the western coastlands will oppose him and he will lose heart. Then he will turn back and vent his fury against the holy covenant. He will return and show favor to those who forsake the Holy Covenant. Okay, we hear this throughout scripture that he is going to flatter those who forsake the Holy Covenant. His armed forces will rise up to desecrate the temple fortress and will abolish the daily sacrifice. What they're talking about here is we are the temple. We're not talking about a temple in the land, literal land of Jerusalem. We are the temple. They are talking about when the temple is desecrated and the daily sacrifice is abolished This is the killing of the witnesses at that three and a half year mark. The seven year period starts in the middle of that seven. The temple is abolished and the, uh, excuse me, is desecrated and the daily sacrifice, 1260 days, that's how long the witnesses are sacrificing. They are going to be abolished. The beast will rise from the abyss to overpower and kill the witnesses. You see that in trumpet number five. Then they will set up the abomination that causes desolation. So 1,290 days later, the abomination of desolation will be set up. With flattery, he will corrupt those who have violated the covenant, but the people who know their God will firmly resist him. So there are going to be kickbacks. There's going to be, you know, security, so-called security, temporary security for those who violate the holy covenant. This is counterfeit Christianity rising. This is those 10 toes that bore out of papal Rome, those who hate their harlot mother, but who are going to join with her in order for God's words to be fulfilled. They will reconcile to her, though they hate each other. And you see that the two kings are sitting at the table and they're lying to each other. You see that there's no loyalty, that this kingdom is divided, but they will reconcile for the moment in order for God's words to be fulfilled. And you can see that right now. You know, it used to be that the Protestants that bore out of her had this, I mean, they were definitely not going to connect with her again. There was clear delineation between Catholicism and Protestants, and now they're st- they've been joining. They've been reconciling. Those who are wise will instruct many, for though for a time they would fall by the sword or be burned or captured or plundered. When they fall, they will receive a little help, and many who are not sincere will join them. Some of the wise will stumble so that they may be refined, purified, and made spotless until the time of the end, for it will still come at the appointed time. You need to hear that. This is your timing. This is the multitude in white robes timing because the temple and the daily sacrifice has already been abolished. So of you who are going to be saved, there are wise who will instruct many, though for a time they will fall by the sword or be burned or captured or plundered. When they fall, they will receive a little help. And many who are not sincere will join them. I have already experienced that. Many who are not sincere will join you. I can promise you that. Some of the wise will stumble so that they may be refined, purified, and made spotless until the time of the end, for it will still come at the appointed time. The king will do as he pleases. We're still talking about the Antichrist. He will exalt and magnify himself above every god and say unheard of things about the god of gods. He will be successful until the time of wrath is completed for what has been determined must take place. He will show no regard for the gods of his ancestors or for the one desired by women, nor will he regard any god, but he will exalt himself above all. 
Instead, he will honor a God of fortresses, a God unknown to his ancestors. He will honor with gold and silver, with precious stones and costly gifts. That's, I mean, you see the Catholic Church already doing that. You see the prostitutes that wore out of her already doing that. What has God to do with any of these things? Jesus was never adorned in them. The God they are worshiping is not the God. He will attack the mightiest fortresses with the help of a foreign God and will create and will greatly honor those who acknowledge him. He will make them rulers over many people and will distribute the land at a price. Hey, remember what Satan tried to tempt Jesus with. I will, I'll give all of this to you if you'll just pay homage to me. The, all of this has been given to me and I'll give all of it to you, all the kingdoms of the earth, if you will just pay homage to me. That's what's happening here. Same schemes of the devil. That's exactly what's been done. That's what these, the harlot and the prostitutes that bore out of her, that's what they've been doing serving a foreign god a god that's nothing they've been given glory in the world status money it's going to perish with them they sold out they sold their souls and they sold their salvation at the end of the t- at the time of the end the king of the south will engage him in battle and the king of the north will storm out against him with chariots and cavalry and a great fleet of ships he will invade many countries and sweep through them like a flood he will also invade the beautiful land many countries will fall but edom moab and the leaders of ammon will be delivered from his hand He will extend his power over many countries. Egypt will not escape. He will gain control of the treasures of gold and silver and all the riches of Egypt with the Libyans and Cushites in submission. But reports from the east and the north will alarm him and he will set out in a great rage to destroy and annihilate many. Why are those reports going to alarm him? Because these are the reports of God's people. He's going to be concerned. He's going to know that his time is short. And you see that in Revelation 12. He knows his time is short. How does he know his time is short? Because the two things that were required in order to triumph over the devil were the blood of the lamb and the testimony of the witnesses, not the killing of the witnesses. They, they did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. And he does indeed kill them, but it is the testimony of the witnesses. That is the second criteria to triumph over the devil. So the devil at this point knows his time is short and that is why he's waging war against God's people. And that is why those reports from the East and the West are alarming him. Remember that the Antichrist is a spirit. The Antichrist is the spirit of the devil. You had to have a Christ in order to have an Antichrist. That's why that spirit was in the world at the time of John, when John was saying the the Antichrist is already here. The Antichrist is made manifest, has been made manifest because it was already in power. Then it fell and will rise again in power, has already been made manifest and will be made manifest again in papal Rome and the prostitutes that bore out of her. Verse 44, again, but, but reports from the east and the north will alarm him and he will set out in a great rage to destroy and annihilate many. He will pitch his royal tents between the seats at the beautiful holy mountain, yet he will come to his end and no one will help him. All right, so... In the situation with Solomon, what happened is the tribes got split up. So you had Judah in, I think, the south, and then you had Israel in the north, and so all of the other tribes in the north. You have a similar thing that's going on here. These two kingdoms, right? This is a divided kingdom, Satan's kingdom, divided between north and south, the harlot and the prostitutes that bore out of her. They're of the same kingdom. None of them are Christian. So stop saying, which is the, church, the true church? There's one true church, and it's in the believer. It, it is those who worship in the spirit and in truth. They don't think about this for a minute. They don't say, well, I follow John Knox. I follow Calvin. I follow Wesley. I follow Luther. They don't say that. But that's exactly what these prostitutes say. They don't impose this tax that, we, that was spoken of here in order to maintain the royal splendor of the harlot and the prostitutes that bore out of her. Because... That is not tithing that they're collecting. They're calling it tithing, but tithing was fulfilled in sacrifice. They are not leading you to set up images, pictures of Christ, the, the image of the cross, little statues and figurines and what you call nativity scenes, but you justify it because it's Christmas. That is an image, guys. You don't set up a statue. You start having a different relationship with that when you're setting it up, don't you? When you're packing it away, you start having a different relationship. Oh, don't injure the baby Jesus. Come on, guys. That's an image. The image of the cross is, the, is a cross to Tammuz, the sun god that has historically been worshipped by pagan Rome and was 
combined into counterfeit Christianity through Constantine in the Catholic Church. You don't go by the Gregorian calendar. There are things that you have to do in this world in order to, you know, someone says March 2nd, we're having a potluck at work, or you must attend this meeting. Obviously, you got to know when that is. But you're supposed to be not taking stuff like that seriously. It's not supposed to be in your heart. You're supposed to know that God established his calendar based on the moon, not the sun and the moon, based on the moon. New moon to new moon is a month. So what is December 25th? That should be a big red flag to you. What is December 25th? Really? God's birthday is on the Gregorian calendar every year? Come on, you guys. The Gregorian calendar does not correlate with God's calendar. That cannot possibly be true. It, and as it is, it is the birth date of Mithras, again, the sun god they worship. One of the many sun gods they worship. That's why everything that they do is based on the sun. Sunday, Sabbath, solar and lunar calendar. That's why they have that halo looking thing around the heads of the saints and around Jesus. What they're doing is they are, caught, they are forcing Jesus to submit to their sun god. That is a sun behind his head. It is the sun that is around the head of Mithras. So what you have here is you have a divided kingdom that's going to come together. They're going to sit. Those two kings are going to sit together. They're going to lie to each other because really what each of them is interested in is, is power. They want power and they want wealth. They're not going to, they, they're not really intending on handing this over to the harlot and they hate the harlot. They hate each other. Their own pastors admit that there's infighting in their church. These are the prostitutes and the harlot. These are the 10 toes that you saw in Daniel, not the 10 kings, the 10 toes. And that fifth kingdom that is made of iron and of clay. They're going to reconcile. They're going to hate each other. They're going to reconcile. They're going to hate each other. And so what you see in Revelation is you see that they are giving their power over to the harlot in order to accomplish what God has said will happen. They're going to give power. And I've been telling you for a while now, I've been telling you probably this, you know, the majority of this year that the systems, the beasts that Satan has established on this earth are going to reconcile. And you see that whatever has his spirit joins together. Medicine, research, big pharma, marketing, politics, religion. Do you not see that they join together for their own agenda, for their own greed? They pat each other's pockets. They are the merchants on the sea that get rich from this harlot because the harlot is the one in power. She is the church that is riding the beast. The woman that is riding the beast is a church that is controlling government. It's not the other way around. It's not the government controlling the church. It's the church controlling the government. She has global influence. She owns a lot that you don't even realize she owns. Many of the universities, all of that propaganda that's coming out that people keep saying, oh, it's the left, it's the left, it's the left. Why isn't, if she owns the, the universities, why, what is her influence? What's her role in that? How about what's going on right now with uh, reparations and uh, you know white people being blamed for slavery? Who was in power at the time? Who spearheaded the transatlantic slave trade? That was the harlot, guys. Was it a white thing or was it who was in power? Because she was the one doing that. You don't have power just because you're white any more than you don't have power just because you're black. That's ridiculous. She was in power. This is not an ethnic or race thing. And God never makes an ethnic or race thing of anything in the Bible. And don't say, oh, Jews versus Gentiles. What race is Gentiles, guys? That was a holy nation. He was establishing what a nation is in order to demonstrate to you that this small group of people in comparison to every other nation is to be set apart to him. And no, you are not supposed to want a human king. And no, you are not supposed to join with the world in order to make yourself more comfortable. You are to be set apart to him. So that's what's being spoken of here. If you'd like to know more, stay tuned and I will do a video on Daniel 12.